So good morning and welcome to those who are joining us remotely. We will get started in just a moment. People are continuing to file in. Yeah, you guys can go ahead and focus. I suspect the past people forgot we were over here. I think they they usually come as a as a, a crowd. Got it. And where's our easy button? I had put one over here. It's right here. Okay, got to got to keep that handy, right? Yeah, did you guys do these with them already? And then these are some that we went through in the fall. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so these you've already gone through both right with the whole group. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so I think we are pretty much right on the dot, 7.30. So, Sean, you want to start us out? Sure. Um, so, pretty unremarkable start of corneum. Uh, pretty unremarkable suggests what about timing? Very acute. <coughs> Very acute. Now tell me about the dermis. So the dermis, uh, you see um, lymphocytes scattered both in the superficial papillary dermis, it looks like, and with some eosinophils. So see that bundle of collagen? Mm -hmm. You got a bundle of collagen above the postcapillary venule. What does that tell you about the timing? It's very early on. Or chronic. Okay. You're okay. not supposed to see okay. any bundling of collagen at all above in the papillary dermis. Papillary dermis is supposed to be fine, wispy collagen. So how can you reconcile oh, okay. an acute horn and yet chronic changes in the papillary dermis? Like a fixed drug eruption. Like fixed drug eruption. Very good. That would be exactly correct. So let me... Make sure here for a moment. Yep, we are. It is not holding settings. So let's get ourselves. That's a little better. Okay. So um, the disconnect between a hyperacute corneum and a papillary dermis that says, liar, liar, you're not acute, something's happened here before, um, suggests fixed drug, right? And then other things fixed drug tends to have. It tends to be not just superficial, but superficial and deep with the infiltrate. The infiltrate tends to be polymorphous. So in addition to lymphs, there are often neutrophils, there are often eosinophils. In this case, you see more in the way of neutrophils, although there are scattered eos. And there is often pigment that has had time to get down around the postcapillary venule. So in something like erythema multiforme, pigment would be here just having just fallen out of the epidermis. In fixed drug, it has had time to travel down around the postcapillary venule. So those are all features that tell you something a little more, a little more chronic going on or recurrent in the same location. Okay. Um, so it looks like we have some, I think that's 
Let's go a little higher. Um, so it looks like there's some hair characters this. Um, pretty acute epidermis. Um, epidermal changes. Okay, so the corneum looks fairly acute, fairly normal. There's a little bit of parakeratosis that's still really within the viable epidermis, hasn't really moved into the corneum. Um, I see a few dyskeratotic cells, um, some vacuolar change, and subepidermal split with um, minimal inflammation. So there's epidermal damage out of proportion to lymphocytes. Favor Absolutely. So this is an EM, TEN type picture. You have an acute stratum corneum, necrotic keratinocytes, death out of proportion to lymphs, and really a fairly sparse infiltrate that's lymphoid only. No EOs, no newts. Unlike fixed drug, not superficial and deep. Unlike fixed drug, no papillary dermal fibrosis. Unlike fixed drug, no pigment incontinence around the superficial vessels. Very good. So, James, what do you think? So when we see this kind of ragged vacuolization of the whole epidermis, basically, with a, not a lot of nuclei, like it looks all bleak and dead and washed out with a pretty acute horn on top. So an acute horn, so that would be then a blue basket weave horn that you're referring to? Uh, no. As opposed to this very compact, dense red horn? Yeah, it's like a medium horn. <laughs> like more chronic? Chronic. Yeah. Well done horn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this could be like a radiation during time, this. So this particular one was radiation. Why'd you hone right in on radiation, though? Because uh, you've seen this one before, or any particular <laughs> characteristics about it? <laughs> Well, that, I don't know other things, that, that pattern of the change in the epidermis is pretty odd for other things. Are there other things that can look Welcome. Like um, so there, there's necrosis in the epidermis, and it's not spongiotic. It's not reticular. Um, suggests something toxic external. Mm -hmm. um, see, you could see it with radiation, you could see it with phototoxic, you could see it with a caustic mm -hmm. substance applied externally. Um, there is some inflammation and there's even some interface here. So that could lead you down a drug category if you were looking at that. In acute radiation dermatitis, you don't have the homogenization of the superficial dermis, you don't have the vascular ectasia, you don't have radiation fibroblasts, and you retain adnexal structures. So none of those clues are, are present as opposed to chronic radiation, which we will look at right now for comparison. So in chronic radiation, you have a horn that has often normalized. So the stratum corneum <coughs> doesn't look that abnormal anymore. You have homogenization of the superficial dermis, similar to what you might see in lichen sclerosis. Mm. How does this slide differ from lichen sclerosis? The vascular ectasia. So the vascular ectasia is one helpful clue. So vascular ectasia, how about the... There's no, um, like lichenoid. There is no lymphoid band. Mm -hmm. So presence of vascular ectasia, absence <coughs> of a sparse lymphoid band below the zone of homogenization, presence of large stellate radiation fibroblasts, absence of adnexal structures. 
So two presents, two absence that help differentiate. So superficial homogenization of the dermis that resembles lichen sclerosis, but what's absent is the lymphoid band. There is presence of vessels that are dilated, presence of radiation fibroblasts, and absence of adnexal structures. You put that all together, looks good for radiation. So hyperkeratotic epidermis, and there's a stratum lucidum that suggests that hyperkeratosis may just be normal acral skin. Okay. So um, maybe like PCT? So we got subepidermal bulla on acral skin. Things, we are in a drug-induced chapter, so you could certainly see PCT. You could see amyloid producing a bulla like that. You could see just generic bullous drug doing it, and um, you could see a linear IgA. So you look for inflammatory cells in the bulla, pretty sparse. There are some neutrophils that could go with a linear IgA. Could also just be that the bullas become a little infected. Any clues in the epidermis that might help? Like entrapped collagen fibers and caterpillar bodies? Yeah, entrapped basement membrane zone forming a caterpillar body is very characteristic of Porphyria cutinea tarda. Very good. One more on this. Okay, so, um, <laughs> we have a, I'll call it a subacute horn. There's, looks like there's a little bit more chronic at the bottom of it, but mostly acute in most areas. Um, <coughs> superficial and deep infiltrate. Um. So let's say there's a little hypergranulosis, and the horns red rather than blue suggests subacute, as you said, you know, a, a little bit of chronicity to it, as would the bundling of collagen fibers above the postcapillary venule. So mm -hmm. both suggest a little more chronic process, not the disconnect between a very acute basket weave blue corneum in fixed drug versus the papillary dermal fibrosis. Um, you see some pigment incontinence. Yeah, suggests there's been as well. and suggests there's been something going on at what level uh, to see pigment incontinence. The DJ. Yeah, exactly. So there's been some kind of interface process. Not seeing a whole lot active here, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, a little bit of interface there, a little vacuolar in the follicle. Yeah. So I'm kind of at a generic interface dermatitis. Okay. Give you a pretty broad differential um, to include um, drug eruptions would probably be high. Um, Late stage of a lichenoid process usually effaces the epidermis a little more. Um, connective tissue disease, boy, not a whole lot active at the junction for that. Not much in the way of follicular plugging for that. So sort of chronic generic interface might fit with drug. Okay. So drug eruptions commonly are interface and commonly have mixes of patterns. If you see a mix of spongiotic and interface, think of viral, think of drug, think of syphilis. In fact, anything that doesn't match up into one solid pattern, think of 
drug, think of viral, think of syphilis. Because if you don't think of those things, people can get hurt. So. Okay. Well done. Let's do a couple more here. And I had pulled out a box that I set here this morning. Thank you. Excellent. Right. Okay. There's some good ones I put in there. Okay. a new slide that's <laughs> just a little faded, and the patient appears very, very thin. Right? You see epidermis <laughs> on both sides. Um, we have a pretty, pretty acute form of about this stuff? Um, dark pigment appearing. Yeah, some kind of pigment. Does it look like melanin? Looks a little bit darker. Yeah, it looks black, granular. right? There's a little bit of melanin, which is brown, and this stuff is black. So you have a black particulate material. And if you flip your condenser down and put your hand in, we we'll probably have to, let's see if we can get that to work. Well, you can look right at the junction of light and dark, and you can see you get them to light up a little bit. Mm -hmm. They're, um, they show diffraction. That melanin is not a diffractive substance, so that um, suggests some sort of foreign material depositing. Right. I'm wondering maybe what this, oh, it looks like it's pretty deep to... Yeah, around what kind of structures? Just uh, eccrine glands? Yeah, exactly. Just loves to surround those eccrine glands. So, what tends to do that? Probably like an argyria. Probably like an argyria, exactly. So argyria, you know, the two things that would be most like this would be argyria and chrysiasis, which is gold. Chrysiasis is not diffractive. Argyria is highly diffractive. So if you get it to sparkle when you flip the condenser down and put your hand in, it's <laughs> argyria rather than gold because gold doesn't diffract the light. Um, the other thing is gold doesn't love the lamina propria of the sweat glands the way Argyria does. Argyria just loves to be in the sweat gland lam lamina propria. So a picture like that, um, just a high power image like that is just diagnostic for Argyria. Nothing else does it. And years ago it would have been um, Argyral um, drops. Nowadays <coughs> it's more commonly people taking <coughs> silver for their health. Silver emulsions. Okay. So, David. There's one little bit of crud on there. Let's get that off. Now I wiped off the tissue. No, there we go. <laughs> okay, there we are. Uh, seven cordium is a little bit compact. Epidermis looks a little bit thickened. Yeah, early regular. canthosis. So something chronic going on here. Um, uh, and then you know, more in the reticular dermis, there's this uh, sort of collection of uh, infiltrate. Sort of yeah, there's stuff. stuff <laughs> right? Polarized. And it is refractile when you flip the condenser down and when you do diffraction. You can see it lights up beautifully right at the 
junction of the light and dark when you're doing hand diffraction that gives you an effect usually similar to what polarization would do without having to reach for your polarizing disks. Although there are some differences. Um, Hemosiderin doesn't polarize, but does diffract. So, um, you know, there are some differences that help lead you to diagnosis sometimes. Okay, so what do you think the stuff is? And how do you think it got there? Um, does it look like suture? I agree. I kind of thought about ochronosis a little bit, but just like color, maybe? Yeah. I mean, it's probably something that got injected intentionally, yeah. right? Um, and then if you go um, for the fellows, it's on the fellow drive. I think we met, we put it on the resident drive, too. There's a, a filler quiz there. It's a PowerPoint that has all of the filler materials, and you'll see a slide of it, and then the next slide gives you the answer. So you can go through and quiz yourself real quickly. It's kind of nice to review um, that because you do need to to know. So this one that has, they're a little bit concentric layered, um, like a pearl. Um, that's good for hydroxyapatite. We'll do that. So um, fillers are, they are identifiable, so... It's, it's good to be able to identify them. And best thing is just go through and quiz yourself. Okay. Adam. All right. So um, we've got a pretty, um, well, relatively unhappy looking epidermis, I guess. Um, it's thinned. Um, there's maybe kind of a subacute horn, but... Yeah, subacute horn, and in fact, how long do you think this process has been going on? Mm, a few weeks, maybe, a couple of weeks? Less than a week. Okay. It takes how long to turn over the entire corneum? 28 days. Yeah. Or, or 14, more like corneum, 28 yeah, days. Yeah, mo most areas, um, about 14 days for the corneum, so about two weeks, which is why if you've got alteration in the upper half of the corneum, we call that the last week sign. Mm -hmm. You know, something happened last week. If it's the lower half of the corneum, it's the this week sign. <coughs> right? So this is a definite this <coughs> week sign. Something happened this week, you know, within the past seven days that happened to this patient because the old written history of the corneum that's sitting on top of it is perfectly normal, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a this week sign that something happened. <coughs> and um, you see... Uh, pigment incontinence in the uh, dermis, in the superficial dermis, you see dyskeratotic keratin uh, keratinocytes yep. in the epidermis. Um, and, uh, I mean, a little bit of vacu uh, like ongoing vacuolar change. Yeah, so there's a little dermis. vacuolar interface. In terms of sites of damage and lymphs, is there a lymph at every site of damage, or is no. there damage out of proportion to lymphs? Uh, the second one. Okay, so we got a this week sign. We've got damage out of proportion to lymphs. Do you see any eosinophils <laughs> or neutrophils? Not, not, not really. Not so lymph that. only, kind of sparse, superficial only, not superficial and deep. Mm -hmm. um, there's pigment incontinence, but none of it's around post-capillary venial. And do you see any bundling of collagen above the post-capillary venial? Not really. Not really. So where are we headed with this? Well, um, I would favor it here at the end of the Yeah. E-M. E-M-T-E-N. And you cannot tell the, the difference between the two histologically. I mean, you've got to look at the patient to see whether it's E-M or T-E-N. And that's not too hard when you look at the patient to tell the difference. Okay. So let's do this one, Dan. We got pretty normal above, but mm -hmm. then what's happening down here? Seems like there's some inflammation in the adnexal structure. But yeah, and specifically what adnexal structure? Looks like glands. 
Yeah, sweat glands, eccrine glands, and what kind of cells? I think they're neutrophils. It's a little bit neutrophils. Like that so, well. do you know anything that would cause a neutrophilic eccrine hydratinitis? Drugs, chemo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the condition is neutrophilic eccrine hydratinitis, <coughs> and it's um, caused um, really by three things. Number one is you see it with chemo, especially ERA-C, most common, but you also see it with 5-FU, you see it with cytarabine, there are other drugs that can cause it. Um, but ERA-C is probably the, the classic chemo agent that can do it. You can see it as a deep variant of sweet syndrome in people where it's the presenting sign of leukemia. And th those cases, you sort of look at it and you say, ah, neutrophilic eccrine hydratinitis. What chemo is the patient on? Well, the patient's not on chemo yet. They are um, pre-leukemic leukemia. They get a bone marrow there, and they have leukemia. So it's neutrophilic sweets-like in response to the leukemia. And leukemias give you atypical sweets, atypical pyoderma gangrenosum, all sorts of neutrophilic dermatoses. And the last one is on the foot in kids with sweaty socks and sneakers, and that's Pseudomonas hot foot. And um, you grow pure Pseudomonas out of the sweaty socks, and you grow the same Pseudomonas out of the eccrine glands, and the kids um, have a pseudomonas infective hydradenitis. Um, and that looks very different. It's young kids, and they look kind of like, you'll think pernio, young kid with swollen red toes. So it looks kind of like perniosis, and they've been running around in wet sneakers, so you know it might make sense for perniosis, except that it's pseudomonas. And it responds to anti-pseudomonal agents. Okay, very good. Um, this one, we will take a look at briefly. So, Katie, what do you think here? So, nice, acute form. Yep. Um, looks like the epidermis is a little papillomatous. So maybe, that, maybe that's a clue to location. Um, and then... That so often su suggests a dorsal lacral site. And some <coughs> spongiosis centrally. Yep, so there. it's spongiotic. Um, and how about here? Is that spongiotic or so what's going on more there? More like focal interface. There. Well, make up your mind. Is it spongiotic <laughs> or is it interface? Is it? What do you think of when you've got weird <coughs> mixes of spongiotic and interface at the okay. same time? It's good for drugs. It's very good for drug, but you also have to think viral, and you also have to think syphilis. Um, so weird mixes of spongiotic and interface. Um, you think of drug, you think of viral, you think of syphilis. Now in this case, interestingly, you have red cell extravasation. You have margination of neutrophils within the vessels. Those are things that you can see with both drug and viral, so it really doesn't help you narrow down between those two. If you saw those and a much more of a lymph in every hole pattern, you might think of pityriasis like anoides. Um, but in this case, it's predominantly spongiotic pattern. Drug that likes to do predominantly spongiotic any particular class? Open it up to the room. I, I would say calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers, yeah. So they're, um, you know, anything can do anything. But 90 plus percent of spongiotic drug is calcium channel blocker. And it's usually an older patient, so someone who really never had eczema before. And there's this old, uh, older patient now who has this horrible refractory eczema. They're steroid dependent. You just landed them in the unit because they went into um, into failure on their um, corticosteroids, um, and they're you know they're really kind of a mess now out of the blue with a new eczema. Look at their drugs, and look for a calcium channel blocker.
they're really commonly used. Okay. So I'm just going to say there's a little bit of compact work though. Epidermis is kind of thin, um, but on here it looks greener than that. Okay. And then um, in the dermis, there looks like there's some pigment. There is pigment. It's not really at like the DEJ, it's more kind of deep. Yeah, and it's not only deep, but it seems to be yeah, kind of depositing yeah. on things and in melanophages, absolutely sort of deep perivascular and when you look at it color wise kind of brown and chunky. yeah kind of brown and chunky a little like hemosiderin would be but the yeah. color's not quite hemosiderin so he hemosiderin's golder than this is minocycline. so minocycline is what you would think then and that actually fits this pattern and this color and any staining pattern that might be helpful for minocycline? Um, you can do a melanin bleach just to make sure it's not a melanin and an iron stain. So iron is positive and melanin is positive. So it's dual positive, iron and melanin for minocycline pigment and that can be helpful. You can also do your diffraction and it's one of the pigments that's brightly diffractive at the junction of light and dark. Um, so it's so unlike gold and similar to Argyria, it diffracts light pretty avidly. And unlike Argyria, it's brown. Um, the granules vary more in size, they get larger. And it's um, kind of a people have described it as kind of a greenish brown looking pigment. I don't know if that it jumps out that way to you. Um, but it definitely has a unique color and it's a clue to put on iron and melanin stains. It's both pearls and Fontana positive. And that, that helps you nail it as minocycling. And it can be very dramatic in skin. It likes old scars. You also um, see it in the gum line and you see it in the thyroid. If you're ever doing an autopsy and you cut into a blue-black thyroid, that's usually minocycline, someone who had a lot of acne when they were younger. I feel like the type 3 was just melanin positive. Was that so there are, there are the different types of, of pigment that minocycline induces. One of them is just accentuated tanning, basically, that you can get. Um, and that is something described in minocycline patients. But the ones that they object to are the blue-black that's usually depositing in sun-exposed skin and in scars. Is pearls the same as question? Yep. Pearls, there are so many names for that stain. So it's potassium ferrocyanide, it's um, Prussian blue, it's pearls, um, um, it's gabori iron. They're all the same or they're all variants of the same. Okay. Okay, it's a little thick here. Um, so, so if you just saw that and you didn't know what chapter you're in, where, what would I you would be thinking? I was in the neoplastic chapter. Maybe. Yeah, like what kind of thing in the neoplastic? Like carcinoma or something like yeah, that. Yeah, or kind of glassy with hypergranulosis no, in the follicles. Keratoecanthoma. I mean, that's what it looks like. So Ka versus, you'd look for a pus, maybe PEH with pus for an infection. Um, so, so Ka would probably be your first choice. If there were some neutrophils and you were in a PEH with pus, what kind of things cause that? Um, like I mean, deep fungal. Yep. And it's helpful to have mnemonics. So that's the here come big green leafy veggies. So the H is halogenoderma, the C is chromo, um, blasto, granulum inguinale, leishmaniasis, P. vegetans. Helps lead you through the whole PEH with pus differential. Um, but then you got some stuff going on in the dermis too. So tell me about what's what's in the dermis here. So let me see. Very busy dermis here with kind of 
this deposition of this uh, very dark pigment in the Yeah, I mean, black in this case, real black pigment that is predominantly in melanophages, especially in perivascular, or I'm sorry, in macrophages, especially perivascular macrophages. So that black pigment suggests what? Um, I was thinking this is like a halogen and dermal thing. Mm, black pigment. Yeah. Black pigment, probably carbon. Okay. Like tattoo. Okay. So it could be traumatic tattoo. It could be traumatic tattoo with infection. It could be tattoo um, where the tattoo ink has had an infectious organism. How does that usually present? What organisms in tattoo inks? Atypical. Atypical mycobacterium. So is that going to be PEH with pus? Mm -hmm. No. It's going to be granuloma <coughs> with neutrophilic abscess. Right. So <coughs> it's going to be a sporotrichoid type of neutrophilic abscess surrounded by granuloma. So different pattern, if it were that. Um, I'm willing to bet money that if you look amid, among and around that black pigment, you'll also find some red pigment because most tattoo reactions are to reds. Um, and this probably is just a, a Ka-like tattoo reaction. So you get verrucous and granulomatous, whole host of nasty reactions to tattoos, mostly to the organic red dyes. Those are the most common. And then you try to get rid of them, and always remember to do test spot because with pulse, um, with um, Q switched uh, NDAG laser, if you do it at um, at um, 523 um, and trying to hit the red pigment, it will sometimes turn from red to black. So you have someone who has. A, th that was described classically, people would get their lips tattooed with red and the red would start to diffuse out and look horrible so they'd want you to get rid of it and your first shot with your um, with your Q-switched NDAG you'd think that you bruised them and the second thought you think now something else is going on by the third shot you realize wait this pigment is turning from red to black which patients do not consider an improvement. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, that one we're gonna skip because it's not specific. So. Um, so it looks like you have a pretty normal stratum corneum or acute stratum corneum. Okay. Um, you see some. Um, yeah, it looks almost a little sebish, right? Mm -hmm. But then down in the dermis, you got some stuff. And what color is the pigment? It's black. Pretty black. Is it particularly in melanophages? Um, or I'm sorry, in macrophages? Or is it just kind of out yeah, there? Yeah. yeah, it's just kind of out there. It's yeah. not all in perivascular macrophages like tattoo pigment would be. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of fine particulate. Really, the individual granules really stand out. So let's go ahead and let's do our little diffraction here. And unlike the Argeria, this one doesn't light up at all. Mm -hmm. So it looks kind of like Argeria, but doesn't like the lamina propria as much and doesn't diffract. Is it gold, gold. exactly. So this would probably be chrysiasis if it behaves like that. Um, okay. Let's see if that 
that's the best section to look at here. This might be even better right there. Okay, so at scan, what does that kind of look like to you, James? I mean, it looks like some superficial thermal edema, like urticaria kind of thing. Or Okay, let's go a little higher. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Probably was very loud in Toledo with the integrity recording. Sorry. Okay. So we've got these gray macrophages mm -hmm. with this crumbly gray material in it. Gray macrophages, crumbly gray material gray. in the gray macrophages. And we've got kind of hyperkeratosis, alteration in the epidermis, alteration in the superficial <coughs> dermis. Any thoughts? The crumbly gray is really not striking a chord with me. Not striking a chord. Okay. Anyone want to jump in? So you are correct. Well done. Where's that easy button? That was easy. There we go. Chemical cautery. It's a biopsy site. So, um, and the clue is, see this necrotic collagen here and there? So you've got all of these epidermal changes that are just post-surgical. You've got all this superficial change in the dermis. So your clue that this is just biopsy site-related change are the necrosis of the connective tissue. And in this case, it remains pink or grayish pink. And macrophages that are gray with abundant gray crumbly material, that's aluminum chloride. Um, would be different with Moncell's in that the pigment would be darker and the necrotic collagen would be more abundant and would have brown on the necrotic collagen that would be visible. So just aluminum chloride tattoo. Um, artifact is um, very testable on anyone's board, especially pathologists. You guys, art of normal anatomy and artifact, like ectopic normal tissues in various sites and artifact are, you know, that's part of your scope of practice, very important, people trip over it, and those kinds of things tend to test well. Okay, so we got a skin <coughs> tag, and what's happened in the dermis in the skin tag? Why is it all bubbly in the dermis, Rob? Um, it's like it's almost like yeah, or all these circles, they're all different sizes and shapes. What'd you do before you took off the tag? Um, like an anesthesia, like an acid Yeah, exactly. So those kind of bubbles in the dermis are just a lidocaine, mm -hmm. uh, displacing, displacing things. You'll see it in all kinds of lesions, and you just need to recognize it as just local anesthetic lidocaine. Of injection or um, it's someone was a little heavy-handed uh -huh. or um, <laughs> along with being heavy-handed goes using a tuberculin syringe or a, a um, smaller syringe uh -huh. so by Laplace's law of the sphere if you are using a 20 cc syringe it's very very hard to push down that plunger Whereas a tuberculin syringe, with ease, you are Superman and inflicting mm -hmm. great pain on people mm -hmm. because you're injecting things under tremendous pressure that you didn't know. If you ever tried to clear a central line, and you'll see um, the intern there often with like a 10 cc syringe trying to clear the central line, and then the attending comes and takes a tuberculin syringe and it just clears. It's because you have just delivered 10,000 times the pressure head with that tuberculin syringe that anyone could do with the 10 cc syringe. Remember, with a small syringe, you are Superman. 
and it's going in oh so easy and inflicting oh so much pain on the patient because of the great pressure head. You can use it to your advantage though for like keloids. If you, you know, you just can't get anything into that keloid. There are two things you can do on the first injection. One is use a, use your usual lure lock syringe and put in TAC-40 and just keep the pressure up as you're withdrawing the needle and do that several times. And you're just laying down little tracks of TAC-40 along the track of the, where the needle has been. The second time you inject, it'll be a lot softer. If you do a little 5-FU in there with the TAC, it also works really nicely. Um, but the other trick, if you're having trouble and the patient's getting frustrated because it's painful, the injections, and they're just not getting anywhere, is just use a tuberculin syringe. Um, always um, hold a gauze pad up when you're injecting because periodically, because it's not lure lock, that tuberculin syringe will blow <laughs> off the needle and you'll have a big spray of the um, triamcinolone into your face. Um, but you can use it to your advantage. <coughs> so that is, the slide was local anesthetic. Okay, so Christina, I think we're on you, right? Um, we have a superficial and deep vascular infiltrate. A superficial and deep vascular infiltrate. And tell me about the epidermis. Um, there's, I mean, it's got epidermotropism a little bit in it. Spongiosis and erythrocytes. Spongiosis with erythrocytes, what kind of things do you think of? Um, that would be yeah, interface with fine. erythrocytes, but spongiotic with erythrocytes, you'd think of? Mm. So PR would be the classic. PR-like drug would be another thing that could do that. And um, you could also see it with Ducus and Capitanacus type of pigmenting mm -hmm. purpura. Um, maybe not politically correct, but Ducas and Kapanakis were Greek. There are Greek sponge divers, so spongiotic goes with the Greek <laughs> names. Um, if it helps you, use it. Okay, how about here though? I see basilar tagging of lymphocytes over here, right? Mm -hmm. Let's get our. <coughs> so I see basilar tagging of lymphocytes, that's kind of interface dermatitis. Isn't that kind of weird to have interface and spongiotic? Can't make up its mind? Um, what are you thinking? I guess you would think drug. So you think of drug and you think of syphilis and you think of viral. Um, and with a predominantly spongiotic pattern, any particular class of drugs? Uh, Don't forget those calcium channel blockers. Okay, very good. I guess we can do this one. It'll be quick. Okay. Splinter. Splinter, <laughs> correct. So you see a granuloma with abscess in the center of the granuloma. And then in the center of the abscess, you've got a wooden splinter. And when you see that, what are you always going to look for in the splinter? Fungal yeah, bacterial. and particular which ones? Um, it's about where I max out. I'm not sure. Okay, anyone want to jump in? Demetiaceous. Yeah, demetiaceous is typically where you, where you see that. So you look for chromo and phao. Um, <coughs> and that's really common. I mean, about half of the splinters you see in tissue have chromo or phao organisms in them. Um, usually the excision is curative. But, um, you know, then you're ready to follow up with antifungal treatment if you need to. Okay. Okay, so where are we anatomically? What are we looking at here? 
one of your path colleagues may be able to help you out. Yeah, minor salivary glands, right? So put your tongue right in the bottom, middle of your lip, middle of your bottom lip. You don't feel much. Now go just to the right and just to the left around where your mental nerve comes out of your chin, and you feel all that tapioca in there. Those are your minor salivary glands. That's what you will biopsy for Sjogren's. You'll biopsy it for amyloid. Um, never snip when you're doing that biopsy because remember that's right where the mental nerve comes out. So you make a slit. You can dissect with your um, outward repeatedly with your scissors, but never snip with your scissors because you can snip the mental nerve. And then you pop your minor salivary glands out. In this case, why is there black stuff in the submucosa and in the minor surrounding the minor salivary glands? Um, amalgam, tattoo. amalgam tattoo would be the most likely. Um, so looks a little bit like gold or chrysiasis. Um, amalgam is brightly, brightly diffractive. You can see, look at how that sucker lights up when you put your hand there. So it's much more brightly dis diffractive than either um, gold or silver would be. Um, and it tends to be on a mucosal surface. So patient comes in and they say they see the bugs and the bugs are eating them alive and they try to pick them out and they bring you um, lots and lots of slides with the little things taped onto them and they mail you letters with lots of scabs and things mm. taped onto them and then they send this in and they say, you know, this is it. I found it. This is the creature that's infecting me. <laughs> so are they delusional? Are, uh, are you delusional? <laughs> um, <laughs> what are we no, looking at here? I mean, this doesn't look human. It looks like a blood-filled gut or something, yeah, right? Is sure. this a blood-sucking arthropod of some sort? Is this alien? What are we looking at? It looks vegetable. It looks vegetable. Why do you say vegetable, sir? The, the cell wall. Yeah, because you see cell walls, and you see rectangular things with cell walls here. And that's, you know, that's a chitinous wall that tells you it's vegetable. So you see it... Um, so it's like celery on the patient's skin or something? Well, like... Um, Poly, bits of pollen, bits of seeds, things like that that, that patients find, burrs on their clothing, things like that. Um, and the key is when you look in the center, it can look almost like a blood-filled gut, you know, like the way you see that in a tick, except that all of these are surrounded by, <coughs> compartmentalized, surrounded by chitinous walls. What was the bluish structure? Um? Kind of out of the field here. Oh, okay. Let's go. Up. Let's go down lower power and see. Oh yeah, that. Oh, that um, is probably like an endosperm. Okay. In a seed. Um, yes, and again, that. you can see that it's made up of square or rectangular things lined up with chitinous wall. Um, so you know that it's kind of like that's the wheat germ, gotcha. right? Um, so um, th it all goes with plant rather than animal. But th the key is to recognize the chitinous walls, the rectangular mm -hmm. chitinous walls. 
um, but also recognize that you can have that stuff that fakes you out and makes you think it's a blood-filled gut of an arthropod of some sort. <clears throat> Let's see what we got here. Okay. So, a little bit faded, um, which sometimes can mean an old slide, but more commonly means necrosis. Because necrotic tissue just doesn't take up hematoxylin. It only takes up eosin. So when you go to the great beyond, if you want to know what death looks like, it's red. That's what death is like. It's red. Eosinophilic. Um, so, okay, so Dan, what do you see here? Um, looks pretty dead. Um, Looks pretty dead. But there's also some, I think there's some structures that have like a halo. Or no, it's, there's one body. I'm not sure. Huh. So this is kind of glassy. May actually look up on the screen because your okay. the camera is adjusting for the for okay. the necrosis and the pale staining. Um, this is all probably glassy keratinocyte. Mm. It's kind of jagged and irregular. And then there are inflammatory cells, mm -hmm. and the inflammatory cells, um, do they have a single round nucleus, or do they have multiple nuclei like a segmented body? It looks like they have multiple nuclei. Yeah. So what would have multiple nuclei, what kind of inflammatory cell would have multiple nuclei like a segmented body that you can still make out even when necrotic? Um. Like a or, or like neutrophils. Okay, so we've got glassy pseudoepithelium and hyperplasia and neutrophils. That puts me in a PEH with pus type differential. Do you want to help me with that? Um, is that here come green leafy vegetables? Here come big green leafy veggies. So that would include what? Halogenoderma. Which is what this was. Okay, but what else? Um, Chromo. Blasto, um, granulome gonali, leishmaniasis, pemphigus vegetans. On the uh, real board exam for us, would they give us a slide that's like ultra, ultra old and faded, or is that kind of, do they have to be um, recent? They, um, there is no way that I can see any of the people putting together the exam putting anything less than beautiful images and slides. Um, now, for derm path and for path boards, sometimes the task is dealing with what you have, which is necrotic tissue, et cetera. You know, that's part of your scope of practice, real life. But for a derm board, I mean, that that's just frustrating to the candidates. You have a few of those on the exam and you have to institute suicide precautions. I mean, that is demoralizing <laughs> to people. I mean, the, it should, they should be beautiful quality slides. And, you know, the group that's putting together the glass, um, there's plenty of gorgeous glass, so I, I don't see why they would use anything else. I don't know if they'd be like, here's this 40-year-old example of... <laughs> Um, so that that kind of thing <laughs> happened in days of yore, uh, um, especially with like faded ectochromes and things um, that just no, that it's just not acceptable um, to have that on an exam. So, okay. So what do we see here? <coughs> Focally, we have a collection of pigment within macrophages. It has kind of a golden color. Yeah, looks kind of like what? Looks similar to hemosiderin. Yeah, it looks kind of like hemosiderin. And it is refractile, it twinkles at you like hemosiderin. It is also diffractive, which hemosiderin is. Um, but if you polarize this, you might find it polarizes a little bit, which hemosiderin usually doesn't do. 
and then the other thing that we have here, why do we have all of this brownish gray necrotic collagen? Um, some of that looks like foreign body. Mm -hmm. If you have some giant cells, looks like the body's trying to eat it. And if you look, kind of step back, you can see normal collagen here, and then here the collagen's kind of dense, your reedy patterns are faced, your collagen goes east-west, some of your vessels go north-south, like you got a scar there. So what would be this brown hemosiderin? In Moncel's? Yeah, Moncel's. And necrotic collagen with a hemosiderin like pigment is usually Moncel's solution. stuff here. Okay. So. Oh, so we got some compound pores in those. Yep. There's either a tear in the tissue or maybe like a little vocal discoordination. Yeah. That, that's probably artifact. Yeah. But there is some kind of um, inflammation up there by the DEJ. And it looks like there's kind of um, periodosterone, maybe periodosterone. And, and what? Well, they're all like, kind of homogenized. And what kind of inflammation do we have? Um, well, yeah, lots of granulomas there. So we got fibrosis and granulomas. And there is refractile material there. In fact, when you diffract it, it's pretty brightly refractile. Um, and if you did polarization, you'd see very bright. So what is that probably? Yeah, or silica. Um, kind of looks almost crystalline material. So silica granuloma, um, anything you have to follow the patient for? Mm -hmm. Other thing you have to follow them for is sarcoid. Because silica granuloma probably does not happen in anyone who's not prone to sarcoid. So show of hands, who here has not skinned their knee ever in their life as a kid? So why don't you all have <coughs> silica granulomas? You all have silica in your skin because you only form a granuloma around the silica if you have a tendency for sarcoid. So when I was a resident, we were taught this is a look-alike for sarcoid, except that there have been now hundreds of patients described who were told they had silica granuloma who go on to pulmonary sarcoid. And it's silica granuloma is scar sarcoid. So everyone gets silica ground into their skin at some point in their life because they get road rash. Um, the people who form granulomas around it, it's just like putting a latent diabetic on prednisone. It just brings out the trait. It gives a nidus for the um, sarcoidal granulomas to form. So. If you see silica granuloma, it's not just a look-alike for sarcoid, it is sarcoid. It's scar sarcoid. And so you then look, all of these patients need to be followed for development of sarcoidosis. And with that, we are at the end of the hour. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, sir.